We'll read from verse 8 through to 17. 2 Samuel chapter 23, commencing at verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Yosheb, Bashabeth, the Tachamite, chief among the captains. He was called Adino the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. After him was Eliza, the son of Dodo, the Hoahite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel had retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field defended it and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold. And the garrison of the Philistines were then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And so the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this, is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Friends, together let's look to our God and ask him for help as we come to this part of his word. Almighty God, we thank you that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We thank you for the, where we have just read is just as much inspired by your Spirit as the New Testament. And we thank you that this portion of your Word is profitable for us this morning. And so, Lord, we call out to you on the basis of what you yourself claim your Bible to be. And we plead with you that by your Spirit that you would bring much profit to our hearts and our souls. You would bring us instruction and you would bring us correction, that you would bring us training in the paths of righteousness. And even through this part of your word, that you would show us your Son, that you would show us again our great Saviour, that you would stir our hearts in love for Him, motivating us even to serve Him with a freshness. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, friends, we're returning to this, what truly we could say is an action-packed part of the Old Testament scriptures, to the king's mighty men. Last Lord's Day, those of you who were with us will remember, we considered the trio who were valiant. That's David's top three troops, the, the crack troops, we called them, the three men that we read about just before again, Yosheb, Eliza, and Shammah. Each of those men, individually, as we saw last week, last week in, in particular, they, they engaged in courageous deeds for their king and country. Well, today, as we move forward in this paragraph, we come to what seems to be the same three men spoken about, though they're not given that name, it seems in the flow of the passage, it is these same three men, the, the trio, who now in this part of the story are working together. If last week's theme was courageous service, well, this morning we see these men banding together in sacrificial love, loyal devotion, uh, 
profound sacrificial love for David their king. This was love that we will see here in this passage. Love for their anointed one. Love for him compelled them to daring and dedicated deeds. These men, as we will see, were willing to lay everything on the line in order to gain the smile of their gracious king. This story is filled, this story that we're going to look at between verses 13 and 17. It's it's filled with drama. It's filled with this deep dedication to the cause of Jehovah. And yet it's more than that. It's a helpful thing for us to motivate us, yes, to see how we should act, yes. But it's more than that. I believe we'll see it's a, it, there's a helpful picture for us here today, for us, of the gospel and of the Lord Jesus Christ, David's greater son. And so to help us to work our way through this narrative, I would like us to break it down into four main divisions. And we'll look at, firstly, the historical setting. Secondly, the Davidic longing Thirdly, the heroic fetching. And then fourthly, the graphic outpouring. Firstly, and we must do this, the historic setting. Now, the historical time frame of any of the snapshot stories of valor that we find in this chapter are hard to locate exactly because we're not given them in this passage directly. So what we're looking at this morning from verses 13 to 17, it seems more likely that this event refers to here is at a time when David is early on in his reign over the whole nation. So turn with me, if you would please, back to chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, because here we find reference to this same valley of Rephraim where the Philistines are, which we read about just before in the chapter 23 passage. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 5, we just pick it up from verse 17. We read what's more likely the historical setting. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, based upon your broader Bible knowledge, you probably know that at this point in time, Saul, the first king of Israel, has died. David is now king. He he is king, not just of Judah, but now he is king, finally, of the, the consolidated 12 tribes that have come together, as it were, into one confederacy. And yet at this very time, in these early days, the nation is vulnerable to the enemy. You notice earlier on in chapter 5, we won't read it, but you'll notice there that Jerusalem had been won from the Jebusites. Jerusalem was established as the capital of the newly united nation. But things were still a little unstable. And it seems that the Philistines, sensing an opportunity to make a strike, make their move. And they had come deep into the land. As we read in chapter 23, they had already seized control of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is located only five miles away from Jerusalem, the capital. And so perceiving the danger, David here in chapter 23, as we come to this this story he set up his stronghold in the high ground of the cave of Abdullam which of course if you know the story of David that's a well known spot for David from his his recent years of wilderness survival he goes back to that place that he knew that it was secure he understood where all the crevices were in that particular cave it's obviously a very large cave or series of caves if it could house all his men even from the previous experience We come back to 2 Samuel 23 and we think then about that setting. We come back to the passage of our focus in verse 13. It says, Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Abdullam. 
And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. When did this happen? According to verse 13, specifically what time of year, he says? Harvest time. Perhaps, as we mentioned last week, Part of the, the, the very reason for the Philistines to be in the land again also was connected to harvest time. It was time for them to come and to strip the fields of the, the ripe crops and to take the spoils back home into their own territory in Gaza. It's harvest time, which for them is the hottest time in the year. And it certainly is a hot time for, for young King David, God's anointed in his role. Here he is. He's hunted, according to the passage, by the enemy. The enemy, with all their strong forces, don't want David in control of this area, of this territory. And so here's the scene. It is an occasion, I hope you can see, of great distress. It's, it's, an, it's an occasion of deep discouragement or potentially. You think about this. After years of waiting, and it looked like finally God's promise was being fulfilled. Just as Samuel years before had anointed David, now he's recognized as king. But this, he suffers a setback. The enemy had invaded their territory and they are in control of their formerly loved heartland. It looks like the Philistines are about to overrun them. It looks like the Philistines are about to dash the delicate kingdom to pieces. And there in the cave of Abdullam, we have the second thing this morning in this passage, and that's the Davidic longing. And that comes to us in verse 15. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, some read this, some commentators, some who otherwise I think are excellent commentators, <laughs> But, but some read this as David, in the heat of the summer, he's in great distress, he's consumed with selfish desires, he wants his fleshly thirst satisfied, and in some sort of reckless and irresponsible way, he asks for a drink from that particular fountain. But is that what is really going on here? I personally don't think so. Now verse 15 says, David said with longing. It's not a throwaway line. He said with longing. He is expressing the deep burden of his heart. You see, there, I think there is far more going on here than just David and his thirst. This is about the kingdom. This is about God's honor. This is about the welfare of God's people. This is about God's covenant promises. Ultimately, this is about God's name and his kingdom. I want to suggest to you that David speaks here in verse 15, as he really was, a military strategist. His words are reflecting the longing of his heart. There in that cave, with what's happening outside the cave as he considers the state of the kingdom. So picture the scene, friends. Now remember, this is a snapshot narrative. And so it's just giving us a few quick details. And that snapshot narrative surely is there to encourage us to, to imagine the fuller scene. There's David in this cave, surrounded by his, perhaps, his closest troops, or maybe we may call them his inner war council. And perhaps he has in his hand a, a stick, 
a small stick that he's going to scribble something on the cave floor. He bends down and he gets that stick and he, he's drawing a, ra- a rough map of the land on that cave in that temporary headquarters. And there with the flickering light of a burning torch, the men appearing over his shoulder as he bends down on the ground and they watch him to see what he is doing. And he draws the land, he, he, he draws it there on the ground. There's the Sea of Galilee, and there's the, the Dead Sea, and there's the Jordan River, and, and over here's the Mediterranean Sea, and, and over this part, and that's where the Philistines are, and, and, and here's Jerusalem, and here's Bethlehem, and here's the cave of Abdullam, and there's the valley of Rephaim. And yet as they watch him, He's not just coldly drawing a map. When he goes to point and says, and here's a deep sigh, Bethlehem, my hometown, Bethlehem, those Philistines have pushed all the way from their border into our heartland. Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from Bethlehem. Remember who David is. He's a poet. Poets have a way of expressing themselves that's not always the normal way others would express themselves. Poets speak in colour. We may often speak in black and white. Remember who David is. He is God's anointed king. He is the captain of the army. He is a military strategist. And I suggest to you in verse 15, he is speaking figuratively, not literally. He is expressing the burden and the emotional longing of his heart. And he, what is he saying? I think he's saying, oh, that there was freedom in Bethlehem again. You remember when Samuel first went to anoint David? It's recorded in 1 Samuel 16. And we're told there the words that God said to Samuel. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided myself a king from among his sons. Bethlehem was the town of Jesse, the father of David. Bethlehem, as I said before, was David's hometown. And so we can well imagine that as a lad in his youth, when he was not out caring for his father's sheep, but as a younger boy, he surely would have been playing in the streets of Bethlehem. David knew that Bethlehem had a well. He knew very well (coughs) where that well was to be found, that it was right near the gate to that city. Perhaps he could remember as he thinks back to the fondness of the the days when there was peace in the land and peace in the streets of Bethlehem. When there was freedom in those streets, it was a place where God was honored. Oh, that today, like in my youth, I could drink from that same well unhindered, all in peace. Oh, for those days again when the enemy had not overrun our territory. Remember who David is. He is a man after God's own heart. And he longed for God's honor. He longed for the glory of Jehovah in the land. All those houses in Bethlehem. There he is in the cave. Oh, that those houses now occupied by the idolatrous enemy. Oh, that they would again be homes for God's covenant people. 
where every night the songs of Zion would be offered up in those families in worship to him. Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Bethlehem, the term, means house of bread. Oh, that the house of bread was occupied with ones who love the giver of daily bread. You see the Davidic longing, friends? It was real. It was a real thing in the cave of Abdullam. It was a real thing, not only with David, but I think that spread to others. And can we not as Christians today, even in this land, can we not relate to some degree to the Davidic longing? Think about it. How our hearts yearn as well. How many places are there where where once it was known for gospel truth and righteousness, but now in our day, those very places are overrun by modern Philistines. The house of bread has become the house of crumbs for many. And souls are starving for God's truth. You think about it, houses in this district even, once occupied by Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians where worship in the family was offered to God. But now those very houses, God's name is cursed and idolatry is practiced. What about houses of worship? church buildings once packed with with zealous and hungry people but now many of them are occupied by art galleries coffee shops or like one that I'm thinking of in Ipswich an antique dealer you know the one I mean just across the street from the old courthouse just down the hill from the hospital at that big antique place now it was once a house of worship it was once a building used for evangelizing children in a congregational Sunday school and now on Sundays what's it used for selling antiques and coffee you been there seen it I have I maybe cheekily it's okay you're allowed to walk around inside but I walked inside and I walked up on the platform I stood in the middle and I dreamt how many hundreds could fit in this hall again to sit under the preaching of the gospel today That's a Davidic longing. Oh, that the Lord would open up the floodgates of heaven and that many might come again in the freedom of our country and hear the message of the one who offers living water for thirsty souls. That the house of God might be known again as a house of bread. the offering of the bread of life in the first place, the Lord Jesus and what he teaches. In May 1869, Thomas Gerard became the pastor of the then Ipswich Baptist Church. Thomas Gerard came from the Gyra Baptist Church in Brisbane, And the Jaira Baptist Church in Brisbane was what we would call a 1689 Baptist church. And Gerard came from Jaira. He came to the Ipswich Baptist Church to be its pastor. He was known to be an energetic, gifted, and faithful man. 
at one meeting in the 1870s here in Ipswich, at one meeting, God so blessed his ministry, there was 500 people present. Now imagine that today in Ipswich. 500 people coming for a gospel ministry. Coming for music, not coming for entertainment, not coming for something else. Coming for a gospel ministry. It was under Gerard's ministry that several outlying preaching stations commenced, including one in this area at Rosewood. In 1886, in this area, a man by the name of John Alexander became the first Baptist pastor in the Rosewood district. That particular man came from the Ipswich Baptist Church and he had been trained under Pastor Young, who was the then pastor, who was actually a man trained by Spurgeon. John Alexander, when he comes into the, to the Rosewood district and preaches... God so blessed his ministry that he started in 1886. By 1887, a second larger building was needed in the Lanefield area to seat 200 people. Those of you who don't know where Lanefield is, it's just in the country area on the other side of Rosewood. It's out in the country. We're talking about the 1880s where there's a very few population. And they needed a building to fit 200 back then. Oh, that God would open the well of his mercy, that there would be many who would drink again of these same waters, and that the Philistines who have come into the land that by God's grace and his own miraculous sovereign power that they would be pushed back and that God's name would be praised even in our own backyard in a way that he has done before. Friends, that's Davidic longing. We see it in the cave. It spread to others. May it spread in our hearts more and more. Moving to verse 16, we see as the story develops, we see thirdly the heroic fetching. The heroic fetching. And so we read, the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Yoshab, Eliza, and Shema, perceiving the great need of the hour as they hear their captain, slip away from that little huddle there in the cave. Hearing the king's wish was to them hearing the king's command. It's roughly about 20 kilometers from the cave of Abdullam to Bethlehem. And for these three to, to get to Bethlehem, they had to pass close to the area occupied by the enemy. So, so how did they do this? Well, we're not actually told. Remember what this is. It's a snapshot. It's not a full-length motion picture with all the special effects by Stephen Spielberg. It's a snapshot. What are we told? We are simply told there in verse 16 that the men broke through the camp of the Philistines. The Hebrew word or the Hebrew verb used there has the sense of they cut their way through. So it doesn't seem that they snuck into town under the safety of the cover of darkness when no one else knew. No. With unfavorable odds, they put their lives on the line and they cut their way through the enemy line. And when they got there, 
And they got to the well. They filled probably their animal skin bottle up with water from Bethlehem's well. And then somehow they negotiated their way safely back to the temporary headquarters in the 20k journey back to Adullam. Seems that they slipped back into the cave quietly, perhaps finding David still with his longing, still bent over his dusty map on the floor. The three men, you can see them, can't you? They're puffing. Sweat pouring from their brows and perhaps blood-stained clothes and spattered on their forearms and their faces. And then one speaks. Maybe it's Joshua, he's the chief man. Hero king! Here it is. A drink from the well of Bethlehem. Now, why did they do this? Why did these three mighty men do this? What motivated them to do such an exploit? Well, it seems to me that evidently their king had inspired them to such heroic service so that so much so that his wish became their command. You see, their intense love and devotion to David moved them to such daring and bold action, or put it in New Testament language. Compelled by love, constrained by love for their king, was what motivated these three. It moved them out of the shadows and the safety of the cave to go and fight the enemy for him. You see, we know, don't we, these men knew David personally. They knew that David was a kind and they knew that he was a gracious ruler. They had witnessed the way that he had conducted himself and they no doubt had had experienced firsthand David's generous spirit. They had seen how their king acted when Saul attempted to kill him. Remember, plotting to take his life I saw how David acted, that he acted graciously, that he acted respectfully. They knew by the way that they had observed this man living, they knew that this man had a heart after God, they knew that he was the Lord's anointed, and they loved this David. And when he expressed a wish, they responded by obeying, and they responded, I suggest, by imitating their king. Or could we put it even a different way as Daniel says, those who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Now we're not told, but I wonder, when when was the first time you think these three ever saw David? Could it not have been some some years earlier. When when a young David went to fight a certain Philistine, turn with me in your Bibles back to that wonderful story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We know it well, we won't spend much time here, but let's just very briefly read a few verses. 1 Samuel 17, just at the start of the chapter, to begin with. 1 Samuel 17 verse 1 Now the Philistines gathered their forces together to battle and were gathered at Sakho, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sokha and Azekar in Ephes, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle ray against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and so on and so forth. We know the story. Down the chapter further to verse 48 to where we have the the event. Verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came near and drew near to meet David 
that David hurried and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in his forehead. So the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that, what he just did, the champion was dead. They fled. Years later, in the cave of Abulon, here's the same David, he's now their king. He's the one who stood in the valley of Elah on their behalf. He had saved his people and they love him for it. He had acted graciously over the years when his life was schemed against and they love him for it. Now these three out of love for their anointed king, they willingly went in sacrificial and loving service love for their king compelled them now of course doesn't this point somewhere else friends Jesus son of David where was he born Bethlehem the greater son of David stepped into the valley of this world Why? Why did he step into Bethlehem's stable? Why did he step into that little crib? He came for us. He came for ones who are fearful, ones who are defeated, who were defeated by the enemy. Why did he come? Well, the angel tells us. We haven't got a guess, right? He tells us, you call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. On our behalf, the greatest son of David came to do battle with the great enemy, the giant of sin. How was he treated? Was not Jesus' life constantly under threat? Did he not have enemies who plotted to kill him? How did he act? You see, especially it was there on the cross, in the valley of humiliation. It was there that he went to do battle with the enemy. When David defeated Goliath, When when, when that stone got its mark, he fell to the ground. They didn't run away then, the Philistines. The enemy didn't retreat just then. It's when David got the sword. And when David cut off the giant's head. He no doubt rose to hold up the giant's head for all to see so that all would know what had happened I could imagine him though the Bible doesn't record it but I could imagine him holding up that head and saying where Philistines is your champion now where's your boasted victory now the enemy flees Friends, when our Lord Jesus rises from his valley, he takes the severed head of Satan, sin, and death, and he holds it up before all of his people, of all those who would believe. As he stands outside and open and an empty tomb to prove to all what has just happened. And the 
question is, where, O oh death, is your victory now? Let God arise, even his son, and his enemies will be scattered. You see, friends, these three men wanted to please their king. Motivated by love. Yes. But did not our king do something far more wonderful than defeat Goliath? Our king has defeated the the enemy of Satan, sin and death for his people. And doesn't love for, for our king compel you to do exploits for him, my Christian friend? He came into the valley of humiliation and death to represent us. Surely the love of Christ compels us. And our Lord's wish becomes our command. We desire to lay it all on the line out of love and gratitude for him. Our love for our king, the greater David. What he has done for us. Who he is and what he has done for us. Has that not captured our affections? Isn't this what ought to compel us to overcome our excuses and all of our fears and whatever the obstacles? To look away from self, to look away from the odds and look in love to him and his victory in what he has done and what he does do and what he could yet do. You remember Paul after spending 11 chapters outlining the various aspects of God's mercy in the gospel. Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 after all those first 11 chapters about God's mercies I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Not risky, not irrational or irresponsible, he says. What is your reasonable service? In light of God's mercies, for me in Christ, I willingly lay it all on the line. I lay my life, in the language of Romans 12, on the altar, a living sacrifice for Him. Why? Because the love of Christ compels me. I see what He has done for me. This is the Christian's heartthrob who's serving under Captain Jesus. This is, if you like, something of the motive being a soldier for Christ Isaac Watts was right were the whole realm of nature mine if it was he says if I had the whole of nature and it was mine that would be a present for him far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life, my all. Friends, as we come to this last section of the passage, perhaps a passage, part of the passage that confuses many, the graphic outpouring. Verse 16 says at the end, and they brought it to David. That's the water, the drink. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. This is not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives. Therefore, he would not drink it. Think of those three men. Did not those three men look on in dismay? David pouring out every last drop onto the dusty cave floor, that precious water. You say, what? Has he lost his marbles? How could David be so ungrateful to respond that way? Pouring all this water out on the floor. 
Friends, this graphic outpouring, it's not a display of ingratitude. It is actually a display of highest appreciation and of deepest love. For hours perhaps David had been poring over this dusty map on the cave floor and then these blood-stained three appear before him. Here they come. Here it is, O king. A drink from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. David's heart wasn't hard. David was indifferent toward them. His heart swells. Perhaps tears spill over onto his cheeks. How could I drink this water that came at such a great cost? This water is too precious to drink. This water belongs to the Lord. Look carefully at the end of verse 16 where it says, But David poured it out to the Lord. In verse 17, notice who he's actually addressing. He's addressing God. David responds in worship in this sacrificial love. Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. You see, like an Old Testament drink offering in the cave of Abdullam, we see this graphic outpouring of sacrificial love for God. It's worship. A sacrificial love offering to Jehovah. You see, this drink was regarded as holy or consecrated to God because it had been bought with blood. David mentions blood as he goes on to speak in verse 17. These men put their lives on the line. Sacrificial love demanded sacrificial worship. That's the point. Sacrificial love demands sacrificial worship. The courageous, sacrificial and loving service of these three soldiers moved the heart of the king because he knew they did it for him. And the end result, the end result was worship of Jehovah, the end result that God was glorifying Brothers and sisters in Christ, soldiers in the Lord's army, when we, out of love for Jesus, our captain and king, when we go and engage in some act, whatever it is, of sacrificial service, I suggest to you our king's heart is moved. When we willingly lay it all on the line, willingly sacrifice in some aspect of service to him, he sees that and his heart is moved. And yet ultimately, all we are doing is faintly, ever so faintly, imitating his own sacrificial love for us. And what comes of that? The end result is more worship for Jehovah. God is glorified. Again, friends, I'm not sure that you can see this, but I hope you can. This is a snapshot story, yes, but it points us to Jesus Christ. David's greatest son, and it points us to his outpouring. His graphic outpouring. You remember what Paul said just before he died? That the last chapter he writes in the Bible is 2 Timothy chapter 4. And he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. My life is being poured out in service to the Lord unto death. Jesus poured out his life a sacrifice for sin. Why? He did it in great love. His was the greatest act of sacrificial love ever to occur on planet Earth. When he poured it out, he left nothing behind. Not one drop left. 
he poured it all out for our salvation. And will it not be that for all eternity, that all of heaven will worship with this very theme in the language of Revelation 4, or is it 5? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Why, why is that going to be the theme? Because you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Now, Jesus didn't just risk his life, take a 20K walk. Jesus came from glory into this world. The life blood of the Lamb was poured out in an act of sacrificial love so that all his redeemed will join that eternal theme of worship in glory, blessing and honor and power and glory to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. May God help us that we may be those who love our Lord, motivated for love because of what He has done for us, that we would want to imitate Him and serve Him, but most importantly, that we would see what He has done and that we would live our lives now, not just wait to heaven, but live our lives now as an act of worship. Sacrificial love demands sacrificial worship. Let's pray.